Body this morning, yes, Father. We thank you for your word. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise you so deserve, Father. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your many blessings, the privilege and honor we have this morning to be in your presence, Father. We thank you. We truly come humbly and reverently, Father, and count it an honor, Father, just to be in your presence. But also, we are the true temples of the living God. You live and dwell among us. You live and dwell inside of us. For greater is he this in us than he this in this world. Father, I know that as I stand here this morning and pray, oh, there are many that are facing difficulties. Some may have even gone astray. Some may not have instruction and direction, and some may not know which way. Which way do I go? Do I go this way? Do I go that way? Do I go the other way? But Father, no matter what opposition, that they face from the enemy today. No matter what lack they have in their life, we thank you this morning that your grace is sufficient. Your grace is enough. All that you've done for us through Jesus Christ is enough, Father. And we thank you this morning for the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us in and through your word as to what to say, but not only what to say, as to what to do. For we thank you for the word of God, but we also thank you for the spirit of God. Father, we're not endeavoring to be like any and everybody else. We're endeavoring to be like Jesus, to walk in line with the Word and to be a church just like the Acts of the Apostles. And we thank you this morning, Father. We say and we thank you for what you've done so far, even this year. But we say, here we are, use us. Yes. We surrender all to you this morning. We surrender all to you right now. As Paul said and as we say regularly in this church, it's not about people knowing us. Our determined purpose is that we may know you and the power of your resurrection. Yes. And we thank you, Father. Many days ago, we have to make a decision whether we're going to be popular or powerful. And we choose powerful for you. Yes. Have your way in our lives this morning in this place. And we thank you the last amen. Your mighty name is going to be glorified magnified, edified, and honored in all that's said and done, and we thank you for it right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God is good. Yes. Amen. Yes. You can be seated turning your Bibles to Acts chapter 3. Thank God. If you wasn't here Thursday night, it paid you to get the CD. This, it doesn't even cost you anything. But it was Holy Spirit led, Holy Spirit spoke, gifts and operation, God moving mightily. We do have some notes this morning. We're going to follow the Holy Spirit. I'm learning, and you'll learn as well. Mm -hmm. The less of you there is, the better off you are. And the more of God. You know, we, we a lot of times we get in control of things. You can be in control and have everything uh, held together. You can have people around you that won't, won't challenge you on anything. You say, well, I don't... I don't want to be challenged. I mean, even in a good way. I don't mean a bad way. I don't mean people attacking me. But, but you can get to a place where, you know, nobody, you've got people everywhere around your life that, that won't say anything to you. But I, I heard a minister say one time, he said, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't like that. He said, everybody else might cater and to this, that, and the other, and even the hurts and pains in the past. But the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll put his finger right where it hurts. Not to hurt you, but to heal you. Not to hurt you, but to heal you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Go back to go to John, John chapter 3. His old your place there. God doesn't have any, he has no intention, never has. He's proved that through Jesus. God doesn't desire to hurt you. He doesn't desire to hurt me. Amen? Amen. Everything he's done through Jesus, revealed by the Holy Ghost, is for our benefits, not for our good. John chapter 3, verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Have eternal, everlasting life. You're a Christian today. You have the life of God. Amen? For God so loved the world, for God so loved the world, would that include you? Yes. yes. Would it include me? Yes. Would it include those that's not here, but that maybe it's supposed to be here? Yes, would it include the individual that's drunk up under the bridge or high this morning from a hangover last night? Yes. yes, for God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, 
For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. We know our victory, our freedom, our life is through who? Believing on who? Yeah. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Is, is not, believeth not is condemned already, because he hath because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 19. Jesus said, This is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You say, where are we going? I have no idea what we're doing. We're going to follow the Holy Ghost. Amen? I will say this. God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, they work in light. Yes. Amen? The devil works in darkness. Yes, amen. Now you sin in the past. You ask God to forgive you. You confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you, and you cleanse you your sins. Amen? And we thank God that it's a done deal. It is not any more complicated than that. It's just that simple. But a lot of times, there's damage, and there's hurt, and there's pain, and there's even things that people are dealing with right now. It's one of the reasons I'm saying this. I do know what we're doing. We're following the Holy Ghost. You, you got to where you're at today because you've been moved by not the Spirit, You've not been moved by other people, although you may would blame other people, but you've been moved by hurt, and you let hurt control you, and you let pain control you, and you try to keep everything under wraps, so to speak, and you say, well, all of these things happen, yeah, but God. Yes. Yeah, but God, but Jesus, amen? He's the healer. He's the deliverer. Thank God this morning that God sent his word to heal us and deliver us from all our destructions. Amen? Thank God today that by His stripes we're healed. That's physical, but not just physical. It's mental. It's emotional. It's pain and hurt from the past. Amen? But what has to happen, we need to understand, we can go back to Genesis, and we might in a minute, but it says here in John chapter 3, verse 19, verse 20, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, Neither come into the light, lest this deed should be reproved. See, God is endeavoring in some of your lives, all of our lives in some degree, but in some of your lives, the Lord showed me this yesterday when I was praying. I just didn't know how it would operate. We used to have uh, we used to have Rottweilers. Anybody know what a Rottweiler is? They're pretty mean and pretty tough. Uh, and we had, uh, I think we had one growing up, then Laura Lee. Uh, I bought Laura Lee one. Her name was Kelsey, wasn't it? And we had her for years. She's actually real sweet spirited. Uh, but we had another one that was, was was the male. His name was Smokes, and he wasn't real sweet spirited. Uh, but that but they were they were tough. And, and that's what I saw was. And I saw this in the spirit yesterday when I was praying. To be honest, and I saw. Uh, I, I, I don't think about dogs too often. We got a little one in the house, but she's very far from a Rottweiler. <laughs> she's a Rottweiler in her head. That's the only thing. But she hit it, yeah, for sure. She's about that tall. She's, she's more round now than, she's, than she is tall. But, but you know, I saw this rock water, and the rock water, they're dangerous. I mean, they can, they can hurt you. They can latch on. Uh, I think Uncle Charles and them, I don't think he did, but didn't they use them for uh, hog hunting? Yeah, they used them for hog hunting because you have to kill them. You have to, to get them to turn loose, and, and, and they're grown and muscular. But, but I saw on this rock water, and, and it had a, a chain on it. You know, we got a little, our little puppy, our little shoes has got a little, a little collar on her because she don't need very much. And, and sometimes she can run out there in the yard and he can just about slip it off and all this kind of stuff. You really, you know, if she's a little bit smarter than she is, she's smart, she'd get out of it real easy. But, but I remember with these rock waters, because they're dangerous and you didn't want them to get them let go. We got them let go. Uh, they got loose a few times where we used to live in a neighborhood uh, when I was growing up in Conifer Hall, and you wanted to get that thing in a hurry because people was running in the house. They didn't, it was, you know, she was about that yay tall. But I saw a Rottweiler, and I saw this, uh, I saw a chain. In order to control that Rottweiler, we had something called a choke chain. You know what a choke chain is? 
If you put a choke chain on their neck, some of y'all want to give one for your children, but you ain't supposed to do that. <laughs> oh, no. I'm not going to say that. But, but this choke chain, you put that choke chain around that dog's neck, and the way that it's fixed is that as long as it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, even when you're walking this dog, this Rottweiler, even though it's got all the ability to about destroy anything or anybody around, all the muscles there, everything's there, because this choke chain is on this, this, this dog's neck, if it takes off immediately, it can go a little bit this way, a little bit that way, a little bit the other way. It can go a little bit behind you. Try to run behind you. But this chain immediately cramps around this dog's neck and will cut off the airflow, and they're not that tough. But the ones we had wasn't. She'd try to drag you for a minute, but she would stop because it cuts their airflow off. You know, the devil's doing that to people in the spirit. They have within them the ability. They have within them the ability, if you're a Christian especially, you have within you the ability to overcome every single thing the devil brings your way. He's given us authority over all the power of the enemy, the Bible says. Yes, okay. Amen? We've been given authority. Yes. The Bible says we can resist the devil and he must flee from us. He doesn't have an option. Amen. The Amplified says of that verse, he'll flee as if in terror. Amen. But very often we celebrate seemingly what he's doing in our lives. We need to celebrate, not just on Easter, but every day, what God's done through the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. But in order to receive healing, it's a truth. We can, we can have this mentality even come to church. You see people, a lot of times people jump around from church to church to church. It's not just because of what's popular. That's a big deal today. I understand that. But a lot of times anything that, I don't want to say it the wrong way, but anything that touches that thing or <coughs> penetrates them or God begins to deal with them in that area that they're protecting so hard, this hurt and pain from the past and they're gone. You don't sin anymore. Because anything or anybody that touches that will see what God wants to do by the Spirit of God and the Word of God is no matter what you've dealt with in your life, He wants to bring it to the light. And we're not talking about giving you the microphone to everybody. You understand what we're saying? You have to come to a place to surrender with God. You can only go as far as you're willing to surrender and trust. Amen? Amen? We're the ones that have to say, no more, Mr. Devil. You're not going to have your way in my life, in my family, with my children. It's not going to be like it's been. Thank you, Lord. But I've also found this. As you say that, and you step out in faith, and you begin to seek God, the Holy Spirit, the Revealer, will reveal to you anything in your life. Matter of fact, when you get a hold of the Word of God, this is one thing you'll see in a Christian that's got any decent maturity. They desire correction. It's not the nature of the flesh. But see, the, the mature Christian or any degree of maturity, they, they don't yield to the flesh and live in the flesh anyways. But they desire correction. Why do they desire correction? Why would I think correction is a good thing? Number one, the Word says so. But correction, the purpose of God's correction is what? It's, it's to show anything that's wrong in my life, not to hurt and destroy me. But because that is something that is hindering the flow of his blessings, of his healing power, of prosperity, whatever it is in my life, amen, for it is still true, even though we are free positionally for sure. We're free in Jesus' name. The gift of the wages of sin is death, the gift of, gift of God is eternal life. Amen. And it's still true that I reap where I sow it, unless I repent and confess my sins. Amen. So God wants to deal with some things in my life. He wants to deal with some things in your life. And we're not going to go back there. But in Genesis chapter 3, you know, you can just ask yourself, and I'm not talking about physically, but you remember when Jesus came back after Adam and Eve had transgressed God, disobeyed God, ate of the tree they weren't supposed to. When Jesus, excuse me, when God showed back up, what was the difference then before? They hid from him. They were naked. They was a naked both times. Well, they got a little bit of coverage. About as much coverage as most people got today. But still, a fig leaf, you know, about like today. That's what the style is. Most people's outfits and clothes aren't going to cost 35 cents. That's how much material it costs to make them. You say, you don't get on those lines. We don't talk about that. I'm going to go to another church where they all dress like strippers. That's good. And y'all can still strip after the rapture comes. Have a good time. 
That's good. You say, well, we don't talk about those things. And remember what I said earlier, we got to get out of our comfort zone. The church has got to get back to the Word of God. Amen. A lot of people say that, but the problem with that is they don't know what the Word says, so they don't really know what they're saying. Amen? Better read and study. And the reason God's been moving and the reason things got so good is because you see, in line with the Word of God, what's wrong? We thank God for it, we correct it, and we move on. Yeah, Amen? Exactly. And we obey it. you got to do that in your individual life. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many times recently, and if a specific example comes up for my life, I'll tell you. But I don't know how many times recently that the Lord said, you know, this is my will, this is my desire, but if you don't adjust this and you don't change this, this has been a hindrance, you're not going to be able to walk in so God's telling me, this is my will and this is what's best for you, but you can't go there with this. You can't take it there. Amen? Mm -hmm. Look at uh, you at Acts chapter 3 yet, or we went to John chapter 3. Didn't we? Go to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. <clears throat> I'm endeavoring to, to lead by example. To learn every day, but obviously as we go as well. Acts chapter 3, we're going to go to verse 1. God's endeavoring to lead us out of our comfort zones. To surrender all to Him. To trust in Him no matter what you're facing today. Because your God is bigger than your problem. He's bigger than your mountain. He's bigger than anything you're dealing with today. Amen? Amen. Acts chapter 3, verse 1, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. Being the ninth hour, a certain man laying from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, <clears throat> to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Uh, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. You know, and he said, oh, now you, you can see, a, a, you should go over here. Uh, not picking on anybody by any means, but you see a lot of times on the side of the roads now, you got little signs and this kind of stuff and, and, and looking for handouts or money or whatever. You say, you give the Spirit of God, promise me I will, because a lot of things are scams today. Amen. Amen. We're very generous, but, but this fellow's not really able to do anything because he's been lame from his mother's womb. It's a legitimate deal. And, and he sees Peter and John about to go to the temple uh, and ask an alms and Peter. Fastening his eyes upon him with John said, look on us. Peter and John said, look here. Look at us right now. And he gave heed, expecting them, expecting, he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Expecting to receive something of them. You know, a lot of times we're expecting to receive things, but it's the wrong thing we're expecting to receive. We expect it to get worse and then get shocked when it does. You say, well, everything I've done, everything I've tried to do, it just had none of it worked out. It doesn't seem like nothing goes right for me. If it's going to happen to anybody, it's going to happen to me. If the devil's going to find anybody, he's going to find me. He already knows where you're at because you talk to him all the time. Y'all build a relationship. Be careful. Amen? So he's looking, he's expecting to receive something from him. Right? Does it matter what you expect to receive? Does it matter what you're looking for? Expecting to receive something from them. And then Peter said, what did Peter say? Verse 6. He said, silver and gold have I none. He said, I don't have what you're looking for. I don't have none of that. But such as I have, give I thee. You know we had to raise his expectations here. Do you know we need to raise our expectations? As long as you settle for things the way they are, they're going to stay that way. As long as you accept things like they are, they're going to stay that way. you got to get tired of it. You say, but my husband, but my wife, but my children. The Lord told me a while ago in Joshua 24, 15, we say it all the time. Don't go there. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And we need to make our mind up. But he said, how does that start out? As for me. As for me. Concerning you, God wants to start with you. Amen. Concerning me, God wants to start with me. Amen. I'm the pastor of this church, and there's times when I'm praying and seeking God. And, and he's, you know, because of course I preach to you and I say, Are you going to do the message you preach? Are you going to do it? 
Are you going to do the message you teach? Sometimes he'll bring back a specific message. And he'll say, that was good, wasn't it? Say, yes, sir. He said, I gave it to you. Yes, sir. He said, are you going to start doing it? <laughs> yes, that's the right answer. Yes, sir. A lot of times we know the word, but it's not the hearer or the knower that's blessed. It's the doer. Amen? You, you can be right in the middle of reading the word of God and something go wrong and you get mad. You can pitch a fit. You can act out. Amen? I can have the word of God in, but it's still my decision. Right? But Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up, stood and walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaving, leaping, excuse me, and praising God. And all the people saw him. Walking and praising God. They saw the fruits of it. And the first three words of verse 10 says what? Well, and they knew. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed, <clears throat> which was healed, held Peter and John. All the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. But this man we see, he's looking for one thing, but Peter and John said, I don't have what you're looking for. You know, I have people come to me sometimes and say, I need help in this area, or I need help in that area. And, 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 and sometimes, very often, I feel like they want me to give them a prescription or something that's not from the Word of God. We don't, as Christians, we don't have another plan. We got the plan that's come from God through Jesus, revealed by the Holy Ghost. We don't have another gospel. The, the Paul said any man preaches any other gospel, let him be accursed. Amen. Amen. Amen? This is the way, the truth and the life. That would be Jesus, right? Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Right? Amen. Jesus came to do what? Yeah, he came to give life and life more abundantly. The problem with the devil is he never shows up as itself. He never shows up as itself. He's stealthy. He's slick. He's a master of deception. Yes, he is. And he's a master in the art of disguise. Two main disguises is number one, he'll give you a thought. We can go to Ephesians 6, but we're not going to go there. But he'll give you a thought, what is 11 or 12 or so there. It talks about the fiery darts as a wicked one. He'll give you a thought, and you'll actually think it's your thought. And you're thinking these things, this contrary to opposite of the Word of God, thinking these things against different people and saying all kind of things and getting out of the will of God and causing yourself all kind of problems. And you think, yeah, I'm making these decisions. And the truth about the matter is, is the devil came in disguise. Mm -hmm. It was him all along. And even worse than that, he disguised himself as God. He said, what would be any example of that? Well, there's people today that believe sickness and disease is what God uses to teach us. That's how I believe John 14, 26 says, what does it say? Who's the teacher? Among other things. But the Holy Spirit is the teacher. Amen? There's people today that cannot move one, four, one inch in their life because they believe that God's punishing them for sins of the past and because and, they, and this is people that's repented but they, I'll never be able to do this, that, or the other God can't use you once you buy that lie and believe that it's true you believe that it's God that's refusing to use you then you won't show up, you won't try you'll halfway do nothing but the reason why is because you bought a lie not be able to contribute we got to realize it wants to destroy us we got to realize who wants to stop you today from moving forward. There's somebody, if not more than one in here, the devil has had a choke chain around you. You've gone a little bit at a time, but as soon as you go a little bit, you, you, you kind of, there's, there's, you choked out, really. He's choking the life of God. Not able to move forward. You move forward a little bit and come right back. Move forward a little bit and come right back. And the devil shows up just like he did. What Adam made you say? What Adam say? When God confronted him, who told you he was naked? When God corrected him, he went to blame it immediately. 
But really and truthfully, yeah, they sinned and disobeyed God, but it was the, the serpent. Right? That showed up. Slick. Undercover. You know, I think about a snake when I think about a serpent. And, and you can be down in the woods, and, and I watch some of these shows. They got a new one on now called Venom Hunters, and they go and find all these snakes. They can walk right up on top of them. And it'll be right there, and there'll be three of them, three people looking for these snakes everywhere, and it'll be right beside their foot, and they want to know it's there. That's how the devil operates in our life if we don't stay fresh in the Word. How do you bring anything out of darkness? We told you before. Yeah, this, you take this room right now, and again, we don't ever do it because it wouldn't work because we got these windows in the back. But, but if you had a, a room and you had total <clears throat> no windows or you could close the windows or blinds or whatever, you cut all the lights off and, and you say, well, I'm in darkness and I've got places in my area uh, in my life, this areas in my life that's in darkness. You say, well, how would I, how do I get out of darkness? God operates in light and the enemy operates in darkness. Amen. He wants to keep you held in darkness and keep those things in your life. Maybe that you're embarrassed of and ashamed of. Doesn't mean you should tell everybody. But God's always placing people in your life that you can trust. Even just one or two. But see, then the devil will come along and tell you you can't trust nobody. Everybody's going to betray you and everybody wants to hurt you and everybody's against you. And the same people that you think is against you is praying for you every day. Amen. Because they believe in you and they want God to move on your behalf. Okay. Amen. But the way we would get light back in this room, if we could make it dark by cutting all the lights off, the way we get light back in the room is not to shut off the darkness. And it's what people are doing. Doing everything they can to right every wrong. And all you have to do is surrender to God and trust Him. You've got to introduce light to dispel the darkness. Amen? That's what we do. We introduce light. And the light is the truth of God's Word. And it's where God operates. Amen? <clears throat> so where'd we stop? Or we was just preaching? We was just talking? Go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. God's bringing us out, but you've got to understand it's a little at the time. Same way with the anointing of God and power of God, and you walk in the anointing and power of God. It's, it's as you get used to it. And as you're faithful, the more anointing you have, the more it'll increase. You be faithful in the small things, what will God do? He'll make you a ruler over many. Amen? Just be faithful where you're at. You say, I don't know my place. Just do what you know to do. Yeah. Start building your house on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Word. We ministered on that Thursday night. Amen? And you'll see God honors His Word. God will honor your faithfulness. John chapter 5. Are you all there? Verse 1. They had a title. And the title was how to receive from God. <clears throat> this is, this, let's just read. John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda. Having five porches, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season in, into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Now you can see kind of the picture of this. Uh, and, and, the, and again, there's all kind of arguments about a couple of these verses here, whether this should be in the Bible or not. But regardless, the location, the place, and all is the same. And there was like five porches around this pool, and supposedly the angel, the ripple, would ripple the water or whatever. And it was the first one, you know, in was the one that was healed. But verse five, then you got this fellow, a certain man which was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Now this wasn't six weeks. This wasn't a bad Monday, right? Thirty and eight years. This man had an infirmity. Verse six. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Wilt thou be made whole? Now I'm going to look at verse 6 in the New Living Translation. This is very, very, very important. Verse 6 in the New Living Translation. You got Grace? Is that Grace in my hand? You got him on the ball. He's doing good. 
when Jesus saw him and knew him, excuse me, and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Would you like to know he's been sick for 38 years with this infirmity? 38 years, not three weeks, not eight weeks, 38 years he's been this way. And Jesus, all-knowing Jesus, asked him a question, would you like to get well? Now, that sounds kind of harshly. Uh, we're not talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to see what he's trying to say here. But that sounds kind of dumb. Who would not want to get well? Wouldn't you think that? But this man is 38. He's been in this situation 38 years. And the Lord Jesus Christ walked up to him and said, would you like to get well? Now, uh, is there anybody in this place today that maybe things are not like you want? Maybe things in your life are not even like you know God wants them and wills them. You've got to answer this question. Well, do you want to get well? Do you want things to change? Do you want things to be different? Or have you grown accustomed to how it is to such a degree that you might would say it, but you don't mean it? Do you know we can create an environment? That's why we talk to you a lot of times about uh, having pity parties and getting attention and those sorts of things. You don't want nobody to feel sorry for you. You want people to love you, but you don't need nobody to feel sorry for you. You want people to love you, but you don't need nobody to feel sorry for you. That's called enabling. Enabling them to stay in that current situation. You love people, but you don't ever go contrary to the word of God. Jesus walked up to this man that is sick and said, do you want to get well? Why? Because he's been this way so long. And if we're a certain way so long, he's been this way so long. This is what this man knows. This is this man's life. Because he's been this way for so long. Maybe you've been some way for so long that other people identify you with the same way you identify yourself. Oh, this is what they are. This is how they are. Maybe you've got things that run through your family. I mean, maybe everybody in your family is a gossip or got a big mouth. Maybe they're full of pride. A study behind John G. Lake. Read part of that book on, uh, on, on Thursday evening that was awesome. But he said, every lake that I ever knew was slapped full of pride. He said, we were lakes, that was his last name, and he said, we were full of pride. And he said, I had to surrender that stinking pride to God before I could ever be anything. He said, I had to make a decision that it didn't matter. My whole family's been this way. Maybe your whole family's been in poverty. Maybe there's been, I mean, predators throughout your family. Maybe there's been perversion. Maybe there's been all sorts of things throughout your family. you got to answer the question when Jesus shows up on the scene, he already asked, and he's here today in the presence of God, do you want things to change? If we want things to change, we cannot do what we've been doing and get different results. It is not possible. Jesus looked at this man and said, do you want it to be different? Do you want to get well? Or do you want it like it is? That is not unscriptural to add that. Because it's just the opposite of what he said. If we said it a different way. So he said, do you want to get well? And then and, and we see in verse 7. Now. So you can grow. And from this down, you can grow so accustomed to how things have been. Even how things have been, even though they're bad, you accept it as your life. This is who I am. No, it's not. You are not failure. You are not less than. You are not a nobody. You are not a hothead. You are not a big mouth. You are not an addict. You are not an alcoholic. That is not who you are. And if you are that person, it's because you accepted it. And Jesus is saying today, do you want to stay that way? Will thou be made whole? Is that what he said? Verse 7. The impotent man answered him, Sir, what did he say? I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. What did he do? What did he do wrong there? What's wrong with that? 
He said, that's the truth. That's what was happening. What's wrong? It's an excuse for why he could not change. Why he could not be healed. Why 38 years was going to be 48 to 58 to 68 to 78. To whenever he died, because he did not look to Jesus. And I, I know this is different for you and I today. When Jesus walked up there, they did not all know who he was. I understand that. He had died on the cross and done all he'd done. Even though his fame was spreading abroad, every, when he walked up there in the crowd, everybody needed to this man know who Jesus was. I understand that. But it's still, he walked, he said, do you want to get well? And what's, what did the man say? He gave a reason why things could not be different. You say in your marriage, well, it's been so bad for so long. It's been so bad for so long. And it, that's just an excuse. That's just an excuse. He said, oh, but I, I did this and I did that and I messed up here and I messed up that. That's an excuse. you got to give it to Jesus. you got to trust him. He's trying to get our eyes back on him. And all of us would say, yes, I'm looking at Jesus, but if we listen to what we say out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This man said, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in. That's the way I, that's my sword. That's how I'm going to get healed because I, I got this situation. This is how I am. This is who I am. And when the angel stirs up the water, I can't get out. Somebody gets down before me every time. So they get healed and I don't. And that's how it's going to happen. What we talked about earlier, Acts chapter 3 about expecting. We've got to change our expectancies. Sitting at my desk one day, and it was at the other church but years ago. <clears throat> and I'm just to be honest with you, I was satisfied, complacent is a, is a better word. And the Lord said, uh, He said, What are you expecting from me? And I said, And I sat there for a few minutes, kind of dumbfounded. He said, What are you expecting from me? And I said, Nothing, Lord. He said, That's what you're going to get. <laughs> it's scriptural. He says it all about more, more, more. If you're talking about more of God, yes. I'm not talking about more things and more people to tell everybody we got. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about setting your faith every day. Your faith is just like your muscles. If you don't exercise it, they don't grow. You can grow stacked. You can lose the muscle that you gained. Amen. But he said the whole impotent, the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I is, am coming, another step is down before me. But then, of course, thank God for Jesus. Don't you thank God for Jesus? Yeah. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. On the, sa on the same day was the Sabbath. You know, that's a problem. I don't know whether you've read much in the Bible or not. Uh, but that's, that was one of the biggest issues uh, that they took with Jesus, right? And, and he's healed this man on the Sabbath. So this fellow said, he spoke the problem, I got no man when the water of trouble to put me into the pool. Now what the woman the issue of blood say? She's tried everything else, yeah. She's tried everything else. And she said, and she's heard of Jesus. She said, if I just, if I just touched the end of his garment. I might not have had no solution, and everything I've done has not got better, but the Bible says it grew worse in Mark chapter 5. He said, she said, but if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. Yeah. If I just, she had to change, she had to realize, no, not excuses, not 15 different people told me this can't change and that can't change, you'll never be this, you'll never be with that, and this can't be restored, and that can't be restored, none of that. She had to realize that her answer was in none of that anyways. The church today has got to realize that our answer is not anywhere but with Jesus. Amen. But she said, if I only touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. And what happened? Did she get what she said? Yes, Absolutely. We're not going to go there. Mark, Matthew chapter 8, in the beginning, in the beginning of starting in verse 1 there, that centurion uh, that sent forth for Jesus to come and pray for a servant to be healed, he said, no, no, you don't need to come. He said, speak the word only. Speak the word only. Speaking the, the words of solution. Circumstances, situations, the way it's been, that's the problem. You can't speak the problem and get victory. Amen? Do you know that? Most people say, well, I am this way because. And then dot, 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 whatever it is. When we need to say, I may be this way, but God, I trust you to help me change. Thank you, Lord. I trust you to take me from where I'm at today, no matter what I have to change, no matter what adjustments I have to make, 
I thank God that those adjustments are being made in my life. No matter what word I need today from your word, Holy Spirit, you show me. You lead me. You guide me. I'm telling you today, you may sit here and you may say, that's me, but I don't know where to start. You start with Jesus. You start with your Bible and you sit down and you say, God, I need help. You say, well, you can help me, Pastor. And other people can help. I'm not telling you. Nobody else can help me, but I'm telling you, help you. But God's your source. Amen. God's your source. And you know it through this word. We've been given the written word, the Bible, so we know the living word, Jesus. Amen. Right? <clears throat> Adam, and we already said, had a good excuse, but Jesus, but God didn't accept it. Amen? And, and there's different ways, and there's different people that's got different steps, even that I study by. But the Holy Spirit yesterday, I began to pray. I went home, uh, went to a birthday party in the Lord, and then went over to Florence, and I went home uh, by myself and began to pray about this message today. And I'm just going to pray for a few minutes and then and then uh, study the rest of the time. But it ended up being the opposite. And, and I prayed and just began to pray and pray in the Spirit, pray in the Holy Ghost, and just really couldn't stop. Just to be honest, just as I prayed, different things kept coming out. I'm not going to say everything, but the Lord said this to me. He said, you must see, I've been dealing with some minor physical things, uh, well, as some of you guys have, but you must see yourself well, you must say yourself well, and then you must act like you're well. You must see yourself well, you must say yourself well, and you must act like you're well. Number one, you must see yourself well. Many people, every person, that they or others will consider a failure, they have a mental picture of themselves as a failure. They believe that they're failures. That is the mental picture they have. He said, well, I thought we were talking about the Spirit. You've got to get the right picture from the Word of God. The mirror you look in is the Word. Amen? Amen. You've got to see yourself as God called you to be. Whatever He said, that's what you are. We accept the Word of God as true. You've got to see yourself that way. You've got to get it in your mouth, right? Because your confession precedes your possession. Right? And then you've got to act like it's true. The reason why is because it is. Faith is an act. God's word is true. There is no higher authority. So I've got to get a right mental picture. And I'm going to get that from where? I want to know who I am in Christ Jesus. Yes, yeah, right here. I am who God says I am. Right? I can do what God said I can do. I can have and possess all that God says I can have and possess. I know that he said he wished above everything that I prosper and be in health even as my soul prospers. Amen? You have a picture of failure, but as you look into the mirror of the word of God, what you see is, see what we've done spiritually. A lot of people have done this spiritually. You know, everything's out of whack and people can look naturally. Not that you should judge people that way, but people can look naturally and say, my God, do they even realize how they are? You ever see people in the natural that go out bubble? Huh? Some of y'all got the little Walmart jokes y'all talk about. <laughs> you know, people go out in, pub in public now, and, and some of them, I, I, don't, I don't dress that bad to go to bed. <laughs> I mean, I don't. You say it's not about dressing. It's, it, it might not be about dressing, but some people don't know anything about dressing. I'm not a style guru for sure. I'm not claiming to be. But I mean, they wear anything and everything, and it's just all kind of a mess. And then the first thing you think is, what were they thinking? My God, did they do they have a mirror in their house? Did they even walk by one and get a glance? Well, a lot of people look at the church and they're spiritual. Because if you don't look in the mirror and check things out, see, the mirror is the word of God. Amen? I got to look in the mirror and say, well, I, I, just, I just feel like a failure. What's that got to do with anything? What does that mean? What does it mean you feel like a failure? What does it mean you feel like you can't make it? What does that mean? You feel it long enough, you talk about it long enough, then you believe you can't make it. Amen? But it works the flip side too. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he says. That works both ways. You're going to have what you say. We need to be found speaking. Go to Hebrews chapter 4. We need to be found speaking the word of God. Amen? Amen. Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> 
says this about Jesus, Hebrews 4.14, seeing then, you know there? Hebrews 4.14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us do what? Hold fast the Yes, now let us hold fast our profession. Profession and confession mean the same thing. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. To say you're helpless is to contradict the word of God. To say you're hopeless is to contradict the word of God. It's the opposite of what God said about you. Amen? We're to hold fast the profession or confession of our faith. Now go back to John chapter 5 because I want you to see one last thing. This is where we're just at. He said you've got to see it, you've got to say it, and you've got to act it. And the only way you're going to do that is to feed on the Word of God and allow the Word of God to be, to be the mirror in your life. Amen? So we see this man... Jesus has healed him. Rise, take up thy bed, and walk, John 5, 8 said. And he did it on the Sabbath day in verse 10. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Now, they, they're not concerned about nothing else. They're concerned about uh, what he, that he was toting his mat on the Sabbath day. Because it broke their law, right? Which is stupid. And there's not a nice word for it. Amen. There's a lot of laws in the church. Now there's people that think everything's law. People that's rebellious say, oh my God, don't tell me that. You put me under the law. And if you ask them to write two sentences about what the law was, they don't know what it is. But they say, put me under the law. I've asked people that before. They say, oh, oh don't tell me to do that, Pastor. You put me under the law. I said, what's the law? They can give me one sentence. They don't know what it is. They got no idea. It ain't the law. It's the flesh. Amen. We're no longer under the curse of the law. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. The, the church talks about the law all the time because it makes them feel good. Right. They talk about grace versus faith versus the law all the time. It makes them feel good. Because you tell people you've got a flesh that wants to act like the devil and you've got to do something with it, it gives them responsibility. Amen. Amen. So they don't want you to talk about that. But that's what we teach and preach here because what the Word says. Amen. Amen. But the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, he that, hath made, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that? Which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk. And he that was healed wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, and a multitude being in that place. So he didn't know who it was, and he didn't know now where he was. Right? Verse 14 Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Now, one of the things that I want you to leave here thinking with today is, is this. This is where the church is at. This is where a lot of us are at. The, this individual here has been sick 38 years. Jesus walks up here, make a long story short. Jesus walks up here, and the fellow, you know, he said, Do you want to get well? And he asked the fellow, and the fellow said, I got no man to put me in the water. There's sick people all over, they're all around. They're all over the place. But they're looking at the water. They're focused on the water. They're waiting on the troubling of the water. So they can step in and be healed, be the first one. That's what they're looking at. Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth walked up. And healed this man 38 years. And nobody noticed it. There was hardly no commotion whatsoever. There was no commotion. It's not listed in the Bible. The only commotion was after when he went to the temple. And he's told them mad. And they get mad about it. People say today, Jesus doesn't do it. We don't, it's, it's not like it used to be in the church. Jesus doesn't heal. He doesn't deliver. He doesn't do all these things. It's not certain things have passed away. It, could, that, could this be the case? See, this was this, this was happened. The, the, it, there's sick people all around, and this man's been sick 38 years. He wasn't healed of a cold. You can be healed of a cold, but it wasn't a cold. He's had an infirmity 38 years. 
to the degree he couldn't get in the water. And Jesus Christ says, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And he's healed instantaneously. Walking, carrying the mat he's been laying on. And nobody noticed what was going on. And we say, well, that's odd. You know why we're missing what God wants to do in the church? We're looking to the wrong sources. Their focus was not on anybody else. Their focus was definitely not on Jesus. Their focus was on the water. Their focus was on the water being the source of healing. Jesus walks up the crowd, heals this man, they don't even notice that. Do you see that? So, without question, now he had to act on it. The power was there, but he had to obey the words of Jesus. And then Jesus told him, don't go back to doing what you were doing before. I would ask you today, today, how bad do you want to change? Are you willing to make some adjustments? Go to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. I'm not, not going to keep you long today. It's just such a glare I can't see the clock. <laughs> and everybody wants to tell me what time it is right now. But I'm just joking. It's not even 12 o'clock. It's only in the second trial. What? Girl? Girl? What in there? James chapter 5. Verse 13. Is any among you afflicted, James said. Is any among you afflicted, James 5, 13. Let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. But he said in verse 14, Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Now a lot of people call for everybody. He says, That's what we should do. These are individuals that are to place the kingdom and pray for themselves. But what is it that heals the sick? Verse 15, The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, this would be a dumb question today. Shouldn't be, but it is. James 5, verse 14, Is any sick among you? In the early church, it was odd for people to be sick. Because when they got sick, the church prayed the prayer of faith. They prayed the prayer of faith. And when they got sick, I'm giving you little doses at the time. Because we're going to a place we've never been. When they got sick, they didn't go nowhere else. They came to the church. Mm. Come on, and, now. You say, are you against medical doctors? Absolutely not. Absolutely, I'm not against doctors. That's not the message. That's not the place that we're going. But what we have done is we have convinced ourselves that Jesus is no longer the healer, no longer the deliverer. And, and the reason why many of us believe that maybe now, would not say it, but believe it, is because just like Jesus walked up here and healed this man at the pool of Bethesda, we ain't looking there. That's a good country talk. We're not looking to Jesus. We're not looking to the Word. We're not trusting God. The first thing we don't, the, it's not the first thing we do is not to pray. Most of the time. But is it what God wants us to do? The early church was healthy and whole. When sickness came, they prayed the prayer of faith and they received, received healing. The sick went to the church, not to the doctor. Do not pervert this message and say, I'm telling you not to go to the doctor. You, you need to build your faith. Amen. You need to trust God. Now, if we look at the man in, in John chapter 5, I just explained all that. But I'll say this in closing. Is it that God is no longer in the healing or the delivering business, or have we quit looking to him as our, store, as our source? Look at Luke 4.18, last scripture. Luke 4.18. God wants to show us some things. God wants the New Testament church to rise up and be who it's been called to be. None of the devil's order of business should be received and accepted in our lives or in the church. Amen? Amen. 
Now, if you just say, Pastor, I don't know, I think you've gone off the deep end. You go and you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read the book of Acts, and you'll see. It is how it's supposed to be. We've accepted less, so we got less. We've accepted complacency and compromise, so we got it. And I'm not against anybody, but a major part is, is that even the church, if you want to call them that, has decided that we can do all of these things with the music and the lights and the videos and, and all of this stuff, and we can get piles of people to come, and we can get their tithes, and we can get their offering, and then we can all be fat and happy, and then everybody calls us a, us a success because we got thousands of people, so nobody won't say anything to us. And the Christian goes to church and cannot read their Bible. Can't, there's no way. They can't read it. They just have to take the man's word of face value. Because if you, you, when you read the Bible in today's church, you see much is missing. Much. Not a little bit. Much. Now I'm willing to change. Are you willing to change? Are you willing to make the changes and adjustments? No matter whether you've done a certain way, no matter, it doesn't matter how many years it is, God's still in the healing. He's still in the delivering business. This is the prayer of faith saves the sick. Somebody's got to trust him. <laughs> Amen. Luke 4, 18, so Jesus came forward, you and I, so let's be doing this now. Amen. You can go to John 14, 12 later. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me. He has empowered. He has equipped me to preach the gospel to the poor. Yes, we're to preach. But he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. So the brokenhearted ought not to be in the church. And if they are, they ought to be coming to the church to be healed. Amen. Amen. To heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. Addictions and bondage and all these sorts of things. We have a lot of programs and a lot of different things that I will never attack. But I will say this, it's second best. Yeah. It's second best. That's just like doctors and nurses and everybody else. We think we got some in here. I thank God for all of them. Some of y'all thank you, doctors. But I thank God for all of them. <laughs> I thank God for all of them. That the, the message is not one of attack, but that is second best. Yeah. It's not God's best. You'll go to the doctor one day, even with simple things, and they may tell you there's no cure. You've got to learn to live with this. You'll never go to Jesus and say that. Now they leave us so I don't understand. I don't understand. You don't understand because we got so far away from the Word of God. Please keep coming and please bear with us. We're getting into the Word of God. We're going to discuss and demonstrate the New Testament program. Amen. Not just discuss, right. not just teach. Amen. 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 And demonstrate. Matter of fact, one of the things God's raising up in this church right here, believe it or not, is it's going to be marked by the healings, signs, wonders, and miracles that take place. Yes. The Holy Spirit told me this years ago, this happened one time, and then I just wasn't obedient like I should be. And I don't know when it's going to take place. Miss Mary's sitting there. You still, you walking good. I was thinking, yeah, Miss Mary, I need to, I don't need a healing. Right. I need to die. Yeah. But, well, I, I think I've got a healing in other areas. But she was largely was talking about Miss Beverly waddling in here. I said, well, I think that's not funny. Because I waddle in here and I'm not pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he feel bad. I'm thinking she's going to deliver. I, I, but there is deliverance for her. See, yeah. man? But to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Is it that God is no longer in the healing business, or have we quit looking to him as our source? Is still his will to heal and to deliver? Now we're going to trust God by faith regardless. But, but as I said, it happened one time before, and this is all about Jesus, not, not about me. Yeah. No, it'll be next week, next month, next year, five minutes. But the Lord said, you're going to come in, and I'm not going to let you know ahead of time. This has happened, like I said, one of the time before, before years back. He said, in your hands, you're going to burn like fire. It's going to be the anointing. And he said, well, when it is, he said, when it takes place, it's the healing anointing. He said, you stop the service and you tell the sick, we're going to lay hands on you, you're going to be healed. And there won't be uh, one half a person healed. The people in the house will be healed. Amen? But regardless, we should be trusting God by faith every day. Amen. We're not teaching it right now. Sake of time, and it's not God's will for this service. But God so wills that you and I walk in health, and you and I so walk in victory and wholeness, that he's, there's seven different ways that God's provided healing for his church. Seven different ways. I'm not going to teach you at home right now. Some of you may know. 
But, but we're moving into some things. Will you all go with us? Will you trust God? Stand your feet. Father, I must pray. I must, but I do desire. But we must pray that this message, as we move into these things, that, 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 yes, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I don't have to have a concern or a worry about things being out of balance because the Holy Spirit knows what He's doing. Thank you, Father. The Holy Spirit knows. So that you guys know and you understand we're not against anybody. Our goal is not to be against any other church with what I've said. We're not against doctors. We're not against nurses. Matter of fact, I believe that there are people that are called and anointed even to those job titles and positions that God's going to be able to use in a greater measure. And the doctors will be trying to figure out it would be the nurse, the same spirit-filled, faith-filled nurse that goes in, you know, and the doctor comes in and tries to find out what's wrong. But the nurse has already prayed in faith and they heal. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're going to move into the greater things. So, Father, we're not against anybody, but we do say today, help us understand what it means to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Show us every area, individually and as a church, that we're not in line with the Word of God. And as you correct us, we will humbly submit to you. We'll repent as we've been doing. And the best is yet to come. Now maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus. Every head bowed and every eye closed. You say, I don't know this Jesus, Lord and Savior, in my life. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For whoever calls upon his name will be saved. You're here today and you say, Pastor, I want you to pray with me. I want you to pray with me. I want you to thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise your holy and mighty name. Thank you, Lord Jesus, and praise your holy and mighty name. Thank you, Father. You can slip your hand up right where you're at, and I'll be glad to pray with you. To receive Jesus, Lord and Savior, your life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise your holy and mighty name. Joe, get ready. No, I don't need you to come up there. Get ready. God's going to use you shortly concerning your testimony. And we're going to use you. Get ready. You'll be praying. You'll be seeking God. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise your holy and mighty name. Maybe you're here today and you say, I got away from God. I haven't been living as I should. Oh, and I see some areas in, the, in my life today that have not surrendered. But I desire to. See, that's the good thing about God. He's merciful. The Lord's goodness and mercy endures forever. He said, if I confess that I've sinned, He's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Simply say, Lord, the way I've gone is wrong. Your way is right. I ask you to forgive me. Just like that. Washed in the blood. You're here today and you say, yes, Pastor. I want you to pray with me this morning to rededicate my life. Slip your hand up boldly. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise your holy and mighty name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God is good. You can look at me now. Anybody got any sickness and disease in their body, you just need me to pray for you. Be glad to now. We're not leaving the Holy Ghost off. I'm adding him in. The Lord told me to do nothing like we've done before. We're not doing less. We're doing more. But he said, don't just go through an order of service, just like we did today. He said, don't keep doing just what you've been doing. Listen and change things up. There'll be certain times or certain anointings to do certain things. Amen. And we're going to obey Him and we'll get the maximum impact. That's what I'm looking for. The walk in the fullness of God. What about you guys? Amen? Yes, amen. All right, we love you. We appreciate you. We thank you for coming. This morning was a different Thursday. Uh, this Thursday right here, uh, Lord and I is going to AFI in Gatlinburg. My brother Jeremy is going to be ministering. It's going to be good. Y'all come expecting. And Easter egg thing is what? Four o'clock. Y'all be here. Amen? God is good. You're dismissed.